and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Today, we'll take you 20,000 leagues under the sea to the eerie underwater museum that serves to remind us to take care of our oceans. Plus, we knew they'd come for our jobs, but will they come for the art world too? What happens when artificial intelligence meets art? But first. Seduced by the tale of Genji, how a thousand-year-old classic of Japanese literature is still inspiring artists around the world to this day. These may look like real plants, but they're not. They are, however, a cautionary tale about the future of the planet. While art is often about creating beauty, it also has a role to play in showing us the things that we don't always want to see. Istanbul's Borisan Contemporary is trying to do just that with a special focus on the destruction of the Earth's natural resources. Using current environmental data, this installation lays bare the ugly truth of what could happen to the Earth's flora and fauna if our consumerist, capitalist-driven society continues to go unchecked. Showcase producer Nisena Tuta was there to heed the warnings for herself. Take a look, but know that what you see the trees, the flowers and the animals might not be there in the not-so-distant future. This exhibition by Borusan Contemporary is comprised of works by six international contemporary artists. They all look at similar topics, today's environment and what it may look like in the future. Merging their ideas with software programs, digitized landscapes and video works, it's as if these artists are telling cautionary tales in their artworks. For instance, this piece is showing some of the chemical elements from the periodic table. These particular ones are used for making cars. And with the help of an app, the piece turns into an augmented reality installation, transporting visitors to a scrapyard in Ghana. The aim here is to show that when we take abundantly from nature with a return policy of no responsibility at all, the result is a damaged environment. For thousands of years, humanity has been making use of everything in its power to understand its surroundings. Magic, religion, ancient myths, even looking to the stars for answers. And now it's technology. But the objective remains the same, understanding nature and our place in it. The organizers find it only natural that we should use the latest technology to narrate our life stories. The artist is trying to express uh, his or herself through a media. I mean, all the, at the old time it was a stone while craving on the, on the walls, then it was the painting and it was photography. And right now we are living in a technological age. I mean, this uh, electronics, uh, applications, videos are everywhere. So the artist of today is using these media to express his or herself. Latest studies warn that if we don't decrease our waste, in only 20 years, we'll have more plastic in the oceans than fish. So art, which from the beginning of time has been a mirror of society, now bears the burden of abandoning aesthetics to reflect what's really going on in our world. Nur Sanatutak, TRT World, Istanbul. The 11th century Japanese epic, The Tale of Genji, has been described as the world's very first novel. The sprawling 54 chapter long saga set in medieval Japan tells sweeping tales of imperial court rivalries, doomed love affairs, and the Buddhist view of the afterlife. And now an exhibition in New York is looking at the influence that this historical tome had on the creative classes over the last millennia. The tale of Genji is one of the oldest and most enduring stories in human history. As well as standing the test of time, it's inspired a millennia of painters and illustrators, right up to modern day manga artists. The exhibition at New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art pays tribute to that legacy by showing the artwork through the centuries. 
The tale of Genji so sensitively relates these human emotions. And so I think this is one of the reasons why it has this universal appeal. So on every level, whether reading it as a tale of the court of a thousand years ago, or reading it as a text that reveals, reveals a religious outlook on life. I think this appeals to readers of all ages and of all cultures. A reoccurring image is the author, 11th century Japanese courtier Murasaki Shikibu. She was staying in southeast Kyoto when one night she was inspired by the full moon's reflection on the lake. Generations of artists have reimagined that pivotal moment. The novel spans 34 chapters with an array of 400 characters. This painting from the late 1600s depicts iconic scenes from every chapter of the book. Most other artists, though, limit themselves to a single moment. Helped by the tale's rich descriptions of palace life, its gardens and artistic culture, they intimately and intricately show the major milestones in this masterpiece. Also in the exhibition is a recreation of the altar from the Ishiyamadera temple. That's the very place where the author is said to have begun writing the tale of Genji. And on the altar are ceremonial objects and artwork borrowed from the temple in Japan and brought here to be put on display in New York. The oldest object on display is this unassuming Buddha. People might just take it for granted when they see the statue of the Bodhisattva Kanon. This is the compassionate Bodhisattva that comes from Ishiyama Dera. It's a 10th century statue. It's never left Ishiyama Dera in over a millennium. The team at the temple shocked the Met with their generosity allowing the statue to travel halfway round the world. The abbot of Ishiyamadera wanted us to put the kanon, the famous kanon, the important cultural property, right in the middle of our altar without plexiglass. And, and of course the Agency for Cultural Affairs said, please don't do that. And we used our own Dainichi Nyorai, the Cosmic Buddha. Artists through the ages have interpreted the tale all the way up to today's graphic novel style of manga. This palaquin carried the wife of a shogun on her wedding day in 1856, with illustrated scenes from the novel inside. Indeed, the book has inspired everything from the masks for the classical Japanese theatre style of no, to the embroidered silk robes of 18th century noblewomen. And despite its age, the novel is still inspiring artists to this very day. Nick Harper, TRT World, New York. I'm joined now by the co-curator of the Genji exhibition, John Carpenter. Welcome to Showcase, John. Thanks very much for joining us. It's in, wonderful to be here. In the piece that we just listened to, um, you said that the tale of Genji sensitively relates to human emotions. What did you mean by that? Well, what I think is remarkable about the tale of Genji is that a female author a thousand years ago was able to speak to these fundamental human experiences of love, of thwarted desires, of that quest that all of us have for intimate, tender relations, and how those are thwarted. So this universal emotion of love is explained by Murasaki Shikibu, the author of the tale, in a way that not only impressed audiences, primarily female audiences of her own day, but then through the centuries appealed to readers of all ages, genders, and now of all cultures. And it's not often that literary masterpieces uh, inspire a thousand years of, of incredible artwork. And can you give us an idea, I know you said briefly there, an idea of the sort of the expanse of, of the influence of this story? Now, as the exhibition has shown, 
This tale of Genji, written a thousand years ago, at each stage of its reception, has had a different impact on Japanese culture. First and foremost, it became recognized as a literary masterpiece, and that was the most crucial first stage. By the 13th century, this early 11th century masterpiece was recognized as a work of literature, both prose and poetry, that should be read by every person of culture. Having established that in the medieval times, an iconography of the tale evolved. And so people became aware of the tale, both through reading and also from viewing art. So the art was capturing a golden period of court culture and Japanese history. So that meant when people of the 16th and 17th century, including samurai culture, wanted to look back to a period when the court was at its peak, they used the imagery, they used the poetry, they used the literary aspects of the tale to become a symbol of the power of the palace. And then a major way that the tale and its art had an impact on Japanese culture is once you have the tale of Genji as required reading for young women of culture, that meant it could be included in bridal trousseaus and so the most deluxe art could be made for presents for young brides. And once that happened, that meant that we had some of the finest examples of Japanese art, not just Japanese art related to literature, but Japanese art of all categories. And speaking of the influence that Murasaki had on women, I know that Virginia Woolf was a massive fan of hers. And what impact did she have on generations of, of authors, um, female authors and artists? I do think that the moment Virginia Woolf wrote a review in British Vogue of Arthur Whaley's translation of the tale of Genji, Virginia Woolf being part of the influential Bloomsbury group, saw the tale of Genji as a work of world literature of universal significance. And what Virginia Woolf saw in the tale was a work that resonated with readers the same way a Western classic would in the way that it talked about all of our quest for desires that will be denied, of those relationships where you are striving for tender intimacy, and it's so eloquently described in Murasaki Shikibu's classic. And so Virginia Woolf saw this, she wrote the review, and I think it's from that moment we can trace the history of the tale of Genji being recognized as a classic of world literature. And, and John, do you think there's a Western equivalent of this book in terms of the impact that it's had on culture, like maybe Homer's Iliad or the Odyssey, for example? I do think in terms of literary impact, yes, it would have to be a great epic work like Homer's Iliad or the Odyssey, I think on the literary level. But if we think about works of literature or religious works that have had such a strong impact on visual culture, the only comparable work in the West perhaps is the Bible in that every book of the Bible has an associated iconography. You have statuary, stained glass windows, murals, paintings for each important episode of the Bible. So in the same way, it became a recognizable iconography. That sounds all very, very exciting. John, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Thank you for joining us on Showcase today. Thank you so much. Coming up later on Showcase, diving into art. 
swimming is believing, but unlike the fish, you still need to get in line to visit this deep water museum. On the banks of the Loire with Paul Gauguin, the first known drawing by the artist goes up for auction. Can a robot create art? We head over to London to look at an exhibition that explores the evolution of art artificial intelligence. The million dollar question in the art world these days is this. As artificial intelligence begins to invade everything from science to space exploration, does it have a place in the world of art? It's well known that Leonardo da Vinci drafted plans for a humanoid robot as far back as the late 1400s. And within the last six months, both Christie's and Sotheby's auction houses have sold their first AI-created paintings. So are mechanical robots capable of being legitimate artists? Let's head to London to find out. The Barbican Centre is playing host to the future. Called AI More Than Human, it showcases some of the most advanced technology of tomorrow, today, and from the past. Together exploring the idea of what it is to be human at a time where technology is changing everything. I think the, the density of AI in our lives is now ramping up so much. It's, we're now at the point where it's um, becoming confusing, we feel slightly out of control. So it's a really good time to pull back and just reflect on this moment and really develop some kind of pathway for ourselves through it. But the exhibition is also delving into religious texts to highlight the idea that AI is not new, but centuries old. The painting depicts a divine spirit that surpasses human intelligence called the Kami, taken from the Japanese religion Shinto. Another is a 16th century Jewish mythical creature called Golem, who was made from inanimate matter and magically came to life. Both can be interpreted as an example of transcendence of sorts. And let's not forget, with great AI comes great responsibility, with Golem's character fittingly appearing in a Marvel comic book during the 1970s. It was important to us to track back the idea of AI to really the Middle Ages because what we see there is that people had the desire to bring the inanimate to life. So the desire to extend intelligence, create some kind of machinic intelligence beyond our own is actually something that's part of who we are. Uh, and we have some wonderful pieces which show uh, the history of the golem, that, the Jewish story of the golem. But in the present, the art world also sees a new artist on the block created by AI. Christie's put this computer-generated painting on their auction block back in December. Named Edmund de Bellamy, it sold for over $432,000, way above anyone's expectations. Sotheby's followed suit a few months later with another AI painting of sorts, which didn't quite reach the record-breaking price of Bellamy, selling at just $52,000. The one big difference was that this AI would forever keep creating images, fittingly named Memories of Passersby. The changes, these errors that you're seeing right now, is the machine learning and saying, oh, I don't like this, I want to do this differently, and that's how the portraits change. So what you will see is an ever-changing stream of portraits, images, um, that is completely unique in yours. The creator of Passersby has brought the digital canvas to the exhibit to showcase the AI's interaction with the visitors and its learning process called circuit training in real time. It's opening new avenues. Uh, it, it, it's able to surprise me. Uh, I have this interaction with a machine which is somewhat controllable but at the same time unpredictable and I can make discoveries that I cannot make in the real world. And while these two examples show that AI has a possibility to step into the art world, it's not quite getting the right strokes with human interaction. The installation shows that the machines are not all powerful yet. 
because uh, while I'm watching it, it is sometimes able to surprise me, but most of the time you can see how much garbage it produces. So it's, we haven't reached a point where, like, where we are being replaced. But it's not all garbage, as AI has surpassed human ability in many other fields, like this game of Go. The exhibition does showcase that the technology is still in its infancy, but it's a tool to help humans learn and do more. But for now, the machines are far from taking over the art world. He was a stockbroker turned artist who had a major impact on modern art. That's Paul Gauguin. And thanks to his peculiar character and highly distinctive artistic style, he became one of the most influential artists of the 19th century, a pioneer of the symbolist art movement. Now, more than 100 years after his death, you'd think we'd have seen all of the Gauguins out there, but they keep coming. And the latest piece to emerge is thought to be the oldest of his known works to date. This watercolour drawing made in 1865 depicts a Swiss chalet sitting on the edge of the Loire River. And the signature on it says it likely belongs to French master Paul Gauguin. I look at the date, July 2nd, 1865, and it clicks. Gauguin would have been 17 years old. Why not? After months and months of researching the archives, we were able to establish the story behind this drawing. Paul Gauguin's first work created while he was a student at the Orléans High School. According to the findings of two researchers from the University of Tours, young Gauguin made a copy of a drawing that his teacher Charles Thought had made. And thanks to archival documents, they were also able to figure out the signature on the painting belongs to Gauguin. The piece was discovered when a client of the Ruliac auction house brought it in for a free appraisal. And now it's up for auction. It's his first known drawing as an artist. There is no equivalent and we have decided to start the bidding at 50,000 euros. That's far from the $300 million another piece by Gauguin sold for back in 2015. It's hard to believe the post-impressionist artist's works weren't even in demand during his lifetime. But following his death, Gauguin was praised for his experimental use of colour and synthetist style that were distinctly different from Impressionists' works at the time. Gauguin once said, art is either revolution or plagiarism. Fortunately, for many, he's remembered as a revolutionary artist. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Don't forget you can head to our YouTube channel for more of our coverage of the global art scene. But before we go, let's return to the theme that we kicked off the show today with, nature. This next artist uses the ocean floor as his art gallery, transforming the seabed with his ephemeral underwater sculptures. It's his way of showing the world how we are shaped by and dependent on the world's oceans. That's it from me, Mari Beveridge, and the rest of the team here at Showcase. Thanks for joining us, bye for now. Thank <laughs> you.